For those watching at home or listening, what, however you're doing this, my name's Austin Belzer. I am here with Noam Kaplan. He, he is the writer-director of the film The Future. It's screening at Tribeca this year, June 10th, June 11th, and June 17th, all at the same place, AMC 19th Street. If you miss one, you just got to remember AMC 19th Street all around the same time. On June 10th, it's 8.45. On June 17th, it's 8.15. And then June 11th, it's 6.30. For those who don't know what the film is about, it's about the Israel's... It's about a lot of things, uh, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> it's about Israel's first mission to the moon. It's about the murder of the Minister of Space and Tourism. It's a kind of detective drama. It's all... It's a hundred different things so i hope i described that well enough for people to go see it whether they're in tribeca for the festival or you know maybe they catch it later but with that said yeah i'm really excited to talk to you about this i probably have way too many questions so i'll try to keep it light so the first thing i noticed is the opening of the film it's different it has been a different cinematography because it's all shot handheld as if somebody's going through with a camcorder and it's it's the reenactment of the murder so what inspired that as the opening of the film i don't know exactly what inspired i was looking for i knew that i wouldn't show any like, actual violence or actual crime in the film it's going to be a film that has a crime in it but it's but not but the intention was to never show it, but it is a visual medium. You have to show something. And so that that's how we came up with the idea to actually shoot the reenactment scene. We weren't sure it's going to open the film. We thought maybe it would be joined in later on, maybe in parts. We weren't really sure about that. But so th we thought it was quite, uh, forgive me for saying, quite clever move to go ahead and also mix a little bit style and open with something completely different from the rest of the film, that you wouldn't really know what kind of film you're watching, and to really mock, mock up a real reenactment. And this is something that I had quite an experience before, because I did some other short films mainly, that was done the same way. They were half fiction, half doco, and I would also appear in them, as I do in the opening scene. So I had the confidence of doing that, without really planning it too much, not rehearsing it even, and just trying to direct the scene while I'm in the scene, yeah. And you know, something you talked about just then was confidence, and I noted it down when I was watching the film. Both actors, Raymond Amsalam and Samar Kupti, both have a kind of similar confidence, but really different. Raymond, I think she plays Yaffa, in the film yeah, the other way around actually. oh sorry dr so Samar yeah. plays yaffa in the film and her demeanor is at both times unbothered but also really smart about that what way she's saying things because she's smart but she's also i don't necessarily this is just taking up my time and i'd rather do anything else or at least that's the impression i got and Raymond, who plays Dr. Block, is also similar in that aspect where she's, I've got a whole other life going on at home. I'd rather focus on that than this interview with Yaffa. And I want, want to focus on what's the problem with the future project, not to give anything away. So I wanted to ask, it's a, it was a long road to ask this question, but yeah. what was the process of casting these two characters, Yaffa and Dr. Block, because they're pretty similar, I think. Yeah, it's not funny maybe, but interesting that you're saying that they are quite similar. Even I think the look resemble, they resemble each other physically, which was not the intention at the beginning of the casting, but it just turned out and we were lucky enough to have it. The casting was actually quite simple. Um, there are Raymond Amsalem, who plays the doctor, Dr. Nui Bloch, she, she really liked the part and she came in and she gave a, a near perfect audition really and pretty much early on it was we knew that she's going to do it of course we auditioned more but she just 
nailed the audition and she was very prepared. It was the best audition I've ever seen. I haven't seen that many, but it was really perfect. And with Samar Kopti, who plays Jaffa, there aren't a lot of Israeli-Palestinian actresses in her, in the right age, not that many. And she was by far the best. And what impressed me the most is that she came into the audition limping, actually using a crutch. She had a crutch or she was, she hurt her leg a day or two days before, I don't know. Um, and I was keep looking at the crutch. She came in doing, to do the audition with the crutch. And I thought to myself, this is a killer. This is someone who would go get her and achieve her. She would kill for that audition, for this audition. And so she would, she could have killed in the real life and in the role that she has to play. And, and that sealed it for me. And she also, she's a very good actress, but that's regardless. Because everybody's good. At some point, you're looking for something else, something extra, something special. Yeah, they were both very confident in the roles. They felt close to them, close enough. And I, we were quite lucky, actually, to get them both. A lot of the film relies on just them in a room talking to each other. So I think, and also as a sort of vessel for portraying sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I want to dig a little deeper into that, actually. I think the film walks this line between trying to find criticisms with both, with both conflicts, but also sympathy. So I want to dig into how did you uh, balance the line of trying to find the sympathy and criticism in both sides of the discussion in that room. This is something that I'm always looking for. I'm a political person and I'm a political writer and director, of course. This is the, I'm committed to this, but I'm also, I also like people a lot. Okay. And what I, I also think, I always think that in order to really appeal to people, you need to present people, complete people with weaknesses, with other stuff that's going on. Even though you are a very political person, you are also hungry sometimes, or you need a cigarette break, or you think you're ugly, or, or you want to dye your hair, or you think of having a baby, or you want to really talk to your mother. And in life, you have these things are in the wind, they are in your head all the time. And so this is how I try to balance, let's say, the heavy issues of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which we... Most of us know about it and heard of and seen for many years and in many films and books and on TV, etc. And try to find a fresh angle in order to present this subject matter in a direct matter, but also original matter and personal. Yeah, and you talk about a lot of things going on. Her mom's birthday, someone thinking they're ugly. Something I mentioned at the top was... Beyond all of this, the future project, the assassination, there's also a countdown to the first, Israeli's first moon mission, I think. I think it's the moon mission, right? Yeah, it's the first manned moon mission. And uh, there was another mission just two, year, two or three years ago, but it wasn't manned. And it wasn't really Israeli, it was based on Israeli technology. But yeah. I just wanted to ask, why, why use that as a backdrop? I'm just curious. This is it's a good question, and it's something that was added to the script quite late in the process. When I say late, I'd say a year before we start shooting. And it was, I think, the last feature that was compiled into this script. Another storyline. And I tried to... It came from something I, I read about and something that, that I was dealing with, that, dealing with is that we try so much to go to the moon and, and maybe we can go to the moon, but we are, uh, the further we, the closer we get to the moon, the further we get from ourselves. That was the motto. Okay. Okay. And I was trying to incorporate this ease of technology. Okay. With technology, it's easy to achieve all these kinds of things, including the algorithm, the sophisticated algorithm that's supposed to prevent terrorists, etc. But then the simple stuff, the simple, not very simple, but the interpersonal stuff, 
and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and other conflicts, they are hard to solve and we are avoiding them. Uh, so I, I use that allegory and also it's part of the Israeli Hebrews that we think that we are very smart and we can solve everything and we can put a man on the moon, but we cannot make peace with our neighbors. That, that's why I put this line into it. And the countdown, the 30 days is actually parallel to the uh, woman's cycle, the pregnancy cycle, all that, you know, is, and also Technically, let's say it gives the film a, a time frame, like a solid time frame of a countdown, and something that I think it's important for audience to know where they are in the film, but not in a very try not to be very simplistic about it, quite sophisticated or elegant, at least try to. First, I want to say if that isn't the tagline for the movie, the closer we get to the moon, the further we stray for ourselves. Yeah, if that isn't a tagline, I'm going to make that the unofficial tagline for the movie. Actually, uh, it was a tagline sometimes, but we dropped it, I think. But yeah, I do think the time frame does work as a narrative framing. And I want to talk about something really small that you did in the movie that kind of interested me. You talk about a lot the purpose of a name in this movie. So I, I just want to ask... From somebody who gets way too nerdy uh, about this stuff, what? why was it so important to have a conversation about names in the film? Or was it just something else or, that you were just really into? Um, another very good question, so I'm, I'm happy for it. The thing with names, I have an obsession with names. And uh, I had uh, my wife and I, we had a hard time picking a name for our second ball, not the first ball. The first one is actually named after a tree, just like many other Israeli names, and it's also in the film. But it, I didn't really think about it until a film made. Before that, it, it was called Manpower, and it was dealing with the migrant workers. You know, the, the backdrop is migrant workers in Tel Aviv, and I was working with non-actors. And this African actor, the main, one of the main characters, told, he asked me my name, and I said my name. He said, but he said, what tree is it? What is the name? What kind of plant or tree is your name? And I said, my name means something else. He said, it's impossible. All the Israeli names, they mean they are either plants or trees. And for some reason, I, it, it got stuck with me for 10 years, this obsession with names. And the, so this is one thing. And the other thing is the, the very cheap use of the language of names that, you know, that, that we have, I think, all over the world. But I know about Israel. For example, the the spaceship is called Hope, which is also the name of the mother of the main character. And also we have now two, two parties, two political parties that they are using Hope and Future in their names. And they cannot give, and they promise Hope and Future, and they obviously cannot deliver each of them. In a way, I try to put a finger on that. I try to point out that, uh, this cheap use of, of language. And on, on the third hand, if you have a third hand, also the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is also about the land and, and the trees and the plants that are on the land and which of them is Palestinian and which of them is Israeli, which is stolen, which is borrowed. So it's another angle on that. Yeah, and I think it's a super interesting, even just as a side kind of thing that you could blink, not even blink and you miss it, but just as a kind of side conversation after the film to talk about names and you talk about land and I, I don't want to talk about that. That'll be spoilers, but, but yeah, it's a super fascinating conversation about it. And you have an interesting character. I don't remember her name and I, I don't know if how much you want to get into spoilers given that only a handful of people have seen it, but I, the surrogacy character. Yeah. She's interesting, and I, and I. How did you develop that character as someone out almost outside of everything that's happening in that that guest house? I'm assuming that's a guest house where they're having it's that. Like a, it's a it's like a home study or a home clinic or something like that. Well, that character came out. It's also quite late addition to the script. Uh, was up until that character came up, this whole notion of having a child was kind of introvert, kind of in you know, its head or wishes. But then you had to materialize that. You had to visualize that. So 
here came this character that, uh, that she just wants to give. And she is a very easygoing person, a very nice person. Everything goes smooth for her. And she's perfect. She can run a marathon. She can have three kids. She can do everything. And unlike the main character, she's a really strong antagonist or an opposite character. Everything is very easy and, every fl- and very flowy for her. So, yeah. So I thought it would be interesting and also a little bit funny to contrast Nuru's character, which is very severe, with this kind of easygoing, smart person who just wants to give. And I think you're not really sure up until the end why is she doing her motives. Are, I think they are not very clear, maybe up until the very end, which is something that I, I like. It's, she's a riddle, a riddle, very joyful and, and nice to look at. Uh, kind of written and, and and the role is very well I think executed by Zorsky, uh, an act- a model turned actress now she's an up and coming actress yeah and everything you said I got in, in fact my I don't know if you are familiar with this anecdote but she reminded me of a California Valley girl kind of person yeah. especially yeah. there there's a shot of a, like a cliffside where you're just looking at all, all these cliffs and like if you didn't say it was in Israel, I could have been like, this could have been California because it could have, I, and I think the best narratives work regardless of place, but I do want people to see this movie. Like I said earlier, June 10th, 11th, and 17th at AMC 19th Street. And then one last question. I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask all my Tribeca interviewees. Yeah. Boilerplate question. But I always ask during Tribeca, for anyone I interview, what are your hopes for this film, for people seeing this film during Tribeca? What do you, yeah, what do you, what are your hopes coming out of Tribeca? I hope people will get the film the way you got it. Uh, pay attention. I mean, it's very interesting for me how this film, which is very Israeli, I might say, in the subject matter, also universal, but first and foremost, it's a political Israeli film shot on location in Israel. I'm really surprised to see how far this film can travel. And I'm actually, I'm so surprised it's even in Tribeca and in New York. I'm so surprised and happy about that. And then I really hope, yeah, I really hope people will get the film, will get what I'm talking about and appreciate it, make them think, not only feel, but also think, you know, about the future. Oh, that's a good note to end it on. But... Again, June 10th, June 11th, June 17th, all at AMC 19th Street. Go check it out. Noam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Austin.